Hi, we're back with the Bridge Rectifier PCB and this time we're going to have a look at the waveforms and the efficiency once we've got some capacitors installed on the output side of the Bridge Rectifier. Now we're going to attach these sides to the DC load and tweak the load so that we're getting the optimal waveform because what this capacitor is doing is basically it's smoothing the waveform between each of the peaks on the rectified sine wave. Without these we saw the voltage actually drop down to zero and then back up to the peak and then back down to zero. What we should see is a bit of ripple but we don't want to be depleting the charge completely from this capacitor because it will kind of invalidate the measurements. I'm going to attach a toroidal transformer to the input, uh, connect that to the variac and let's take a look at the waveforms. So this is the general setup and notice that I'm using the differential probe on one side of the PCB. That's because if we attached a probe exactly the same on the other side, we'd basically be shorting out two of the diodes on the bridge rectifier because the ground probe on each side would be directly connected together. So we do have to use that differential probe. So here are our waveforms for the standard bridge rectifier. In red is our output from our low voltage transformer with a peak of about 17 and a half volts. In green, I've added a math channel, which is sort of replicating what the rectified waveform would look like if we didn't have the capacitor there because obviously now we've got a capacitor there we're getting this very nice blue waveform which is a nice flat line between all of the peaks on the waveform and it's a nice flat line because we've got no load at the moment on the output however once we add about half an amp load you can see quite a bit of ripple and that is because the capacitor is now supplying charge between the peaks on the waveform so basically what's happening is once the rectified waveform exceeds the voltage on the capacitor, it's basically charging the capacitor, which is what we're seeing at this point here. Obviously, between the red and the blue waveform, we do have a voltage drop, and that's what we're hoping to improve with some of the bridge rectifier technologies here. And then once the AC waveform drops below the voltage on the capacitor, the capacitor is then supplying the charge for the rest of the time until we start seeing another rise in the voltage being provided by the AC waveform. Whoops, I forgot these diodes were only rated for one amp. So, uh, good chance to show you the Metcal tweezers anyway. I don't think I've ever really shown these off, but this just makes light work of removing these components. So my little mistake there does provide a useful learning point. I was obviously drawing way in excess. I just completely forgot what I was doing. Um, but... If you were designing a circuit where you're drawing close to one amp continuous, uh, we're actually seeing peak currents much higher than that in these diodes because what's happening, if you remember, is that these are only conducting once the AC waveform coming in exceeds the voltage on the capacitor. And at that point, we're actually trying to charge the capacitor and provide current to the load. And therefore, the peak current might be um, you know, a couple of amps, potentially, uh, depending on how big the capacitors are and what the ESR of those are is so just be aware of that when you're designing your electronics so as we increase the load on the hybrid bridge rectifier you can see that it looks very similar in behavior to the standard bridge rectifier it follows the ac waveform nicely and there's no weird discontinuities which is what we were seeing on the fully active synchronous bridge rectifier from lt so let's take a look at that one next and here we have the LT4320 Ideal Bridge Rectifier. And as we increase the load on it, obviously the capacitor is starting to struggle and we're seeing quite a bit of ripple, but the waveform still looks excellent. We're at half an amp now. Now we're at one amp and we're still getting a really clean waveform. Two amps, three amps, four amps. And now we're starting to overload the transformer a little bit. So here's our data. In blue we've got the 1N4007 and these numbers along the line are basically the power into the system. And I tried to probe everything as best as I could but I think we've still got probably some resistive losses either in the PCB or in some of the wiring. But with the 1N4007 at the lowest power I tested it at which was close to 2 watts we were seeing about a voltage drop of 1.9 volts all the way up to 15 watts where the voltage drop is somewhere around 2.8 volts. Much above that power I was starting to burn out the diodes and they were operating at really quite high temperatures so I didn't test those any further. Then we've got the hybrid chip which is a hybrid of some Schottky diodes and the MOSFETs starting off at 
95 watts, we saw a voltage drop of about 0.25 volts. So that's pretty good for those Schottky diodes that are in it. And then at the highest load, 52 watts, which was basically a limitation of the chip. It looks like this particular chip can't really run with a AC voltage higher than about 20 volts. So that was a limitation of what I was able to test it with. But at 52 watts, we were seeing a voltage drop of around one volt. And I think some of this is resistive losses on the PCB because I had to use some extremely fine tracers very close to that chip to be able to solder onto the very small pads. It's quite a small geometry part. And then finally, we've got the LT4320 ideal diode chip with the four MOSFETs. And this is looking really good this time. Um, so close to no voltage drop at 1.95 watts, creeping up to maybe 0.2 volts at 68 watts, which was the maximum that I tested this at. Then if we take a look at the overall efficiencies, you can see with our 1N4007s, it started off at 90% efficient and dropped to about 85% efficient at the highest power that I tested them at. With the hybrid chip, uh, we were getting about 99% efficiency at the lowest load, down to about 93% at 52 watts. This is looking a little bit better than last time, so I think I was making some measurement errors last time. I was using the numbers on the picoscope last time, which had limited resolution. I did a much more accurate reading this time. And then finally, the LT4320 is significantly better, so almost 100% at the very low loads, dropping down to about 99% at 68 watts, which is really quite incredible. It does obviously depend on your MOSFET selection, but that is really quite an impressive figure and should really improve um, some of your designs if you're able to use it in your particular application. And so you can see what I mean, these tracers are extremely fine. I didn't really optimize this design because I wasn't planning and testing at particularly high currents, but these tracers are probably a little bit too thin to carry those higher currents, so we're seeing some resistive losses just as a result of my layout. However, one person did point out that this chip, unfortunately, is going to be obsolete soon, so you probably won't have to contend with that layout issue anyway. However, since they do provide the internal schematic for this chip, there's probably a few extra parts in there, but essentially two MOSFETs and two Schottky diodes, you can quite easily realise this design just with some discrete components. Now, one other thing to look at uh, before we wrap up is what this chip is actually doing, because it's quite an expensive part. Um, now, what you can do is implement a bridge rectifier with four MOSFETs and not need this chip at all. But what that would mean is that you have to use two P-channel MOSFETs and two N-channel MOSFETs. And the P-channel MOSFETs don't necessarily have uh, as good parameters as the equivalent N-channel parts. So this chip is allowing you to use four N-channel MOSFETs and basically it's got a charge pump to drive that gate on each of these N-channel MOSFETs so you, you properly turn on the MOSFETs and reduce the losses as far as we can. So let's quickly have a look on the scope of what the waveform actually looks like. So here is our waveform. The DC output is in red and if you remember the capacitor is charging at this point in the AC waveform and then filling in the blanks between the peaks at this point here where it's discharging. And at the point where the MOSFET is being turned on, in blue is our gate drive. And what you can see is the gate voltage is actually higher than any of the other voltages in the system. And at the peak here, we're seeing about 23 volts. And the AC waveform is actually only 20 volts. If you remember on this particular MOSFET uh, bridge, we're seeing almost no voltage drop. So very similar to the output voltage here. So we're generating a voltage much higher than any other voltage in the system so that we can turn that MOSFET on fully to reduce the resistive losses in those MOSFETs. Now they don't give too much away in the data sheet about what's actually inside this chip. Normally LT are quite good at giving detailed block diagrams but there's nothing to it in this data sheet. What I can gather is that there's probably a charge pump that works on a cycle by cycle basis. So basically it's powered up on the positive going side of the AC waveform which is why we see that minimum operating voltage of 9 volts here. Now, because it only operates on that side of the AC waveform, it does limit the frequency of use. So DC to 600 hertz only, possibly higher, it says over here, if you can use some MOSFETs with the low gate charge. But basically, it's quite limited in its usefulness. You certainly couldn't use it on the secondary side of a DC to DC converter. And also, the operating voltage is quite low, only 9 to 72 volts. So it seems like it's been optimised maybe for 48 volt systems. So maybe telecoms or Ethernet, uh, PoE type systems, maybe 24 volts or 12 volt systems 
in very limited applications. However, you could probably realize your own design, maybe that can work at some higher frequencies. So if you could come up with a charge pump that can operate all the time, so maybe has some local storage to it, you could trigger the gates to some MOSFETs and run them at much higher frequencies. So I think that's about all there is to say about this bridge rectifier PCB. Probably we could swap out these rectifier diodes and put some shock keys in instead. But similar to this chip, they do have some limitations. Uh, they don't tend to come in varieties with particularly high reverse breakdown voltages. So that does limit their operation. Again, you wouldn't be able to use these on the main side of an AC to DC converter, for example. So I think I might still do a little hunt and see if there's something suitable for that, because one of the projects that I want to do in a couple of months time is from scratch design an AC to DC switch mode power supply. Uh, probably we'll start with a fairly low current device. And then um, as we've got that one working, we can move on to a more complex flyback design, which I think might be quite interesting to follow the design. So hopefully you found this video useful. If you've got any thoughts, if you've spotted any other parts that could be useful, uh, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. A big thank you to all my Patreons who are helping to support this channel. Until next time, thanks for watching.